American Folklore Society meeting in Bloomington, we debuted a new forum entitled Talking Folklore, a conversation with leaders in the field. Welcome to the second installment of this forum. I am, as you may know, Pravina Shukla. I'm going to be the facilitator of this forum that features the, the wonderful individuals that are sitting at the table uh, in front of me. The purpose of this forum is to feature a small number of prominent and important folklorists chosen to exemplify and expound on a particular theme. Richard Dorson believed that if, if we asked every folklorist how she or he got interested in the field, we will gain much knowledge about the discipline of folklore and how it is practiced and envisioned by the people who find themselves within it. We are recording this session, so that's one of the wonderful things about this session. Uh, we are going to be recording it, and once again, we're going to be depositing a transcript of this forum in the Collecting Memories Project archives of the American Folklore Society and Utah State University Special Collections and Archives. I actually want to thank Matt Hale, who's over there manning the camera, who is going to be recording uh, this session again, he did it last year, and producing a transcript again, as he did last year, for um, the archives. The first Talking Folklore panel in 2011 took place on the campus of Indiana University, and we featured an academic folklore, uh, focusing on former students and teachers at Indiana University who discussed their intellectual and academic careers. This year's forum focuses on the public sector. We'll spend the next two hours looking at the life of learning and the choices, chances, and triumphs of participants Olivia Cadaval, Joe Hickerson, Pat Jasper, and Steve Zeitman. Peggy Bulger is listed on the program. I wasn't going to be here. She could not be here due to a medical emergency, so she's unfortunately not here with us at this panel today. As a facilitator of this forum, I'll ask each participant four questions reflecting on her or his career, how it has progressed within the discipline of folklore. Our aim today is to hear the diversity of voices, diversity in terms of gender, age, ethnic background, but also in terms of interests, programs, and regions of the United States. We hope that the end, by the end of this session, through the exploration of individuals and their specific career trajectories, projects, and contributions, we gain a broad appreciation of the important work of folklorists working within the public sector. We hope to reinforce a central position of public folklore in furthering the larger mission of the discipline of folklore. I'm going to very briefly introduce each of our panelists, and then we'll begin with the questions. Um, we might have time for questions at the end from the audience, so we'll see how this progresses. Olivia Cadaval is a folklorist and chair, cultural research and education at the Center for Folk Life and Cultural Heritage at the Smithsonian Institution. She holds a PhD in American Studies and Folk Life from George Washington University. Olivia has curated numerous festival programs, websites and exhibitions, and produced curriculum enrichment materials. She has worked extensively on documentation, public programs, and education projects in the Latino community of Washington, D.C. Olivia published a book, Creating a Latino Identity in the Nation's Capital, the Latino Festival. She's also written for a number of publications, including Urban Odyssey, Creative Ethnicity, Washington at Home, New York Folklore, the Journal of Folklore Research, and the Public Historian. She's currently finishing the bilingual website, assembling the festival program Colombia, and as we learned yesterday, Olivia is a recipient of the America Paredes Prize this year. Joe Hickerson is a folk singer and a song leader. He served as librarian and director of the Archive of Folk Song, later called the Archive of Folk Culture, at the American Folklife Center of the Library of Congress for an impressive 35 years. Joe has a MA in Folklore with minors in Anthropology and Ethnic Studies, uh, I'm sorry, uh, uh, Anthropology and uh, Ethnomusicology from Indiana University where he served as a folklore archivist and the first president of the Indiana University Folk Song Club. Uh, he also served as biographer for 22 years and secretary for eight years 
for the Society of Ethnomusicology. Uh, and he was a chair of the Committee on Archiving for the American Folklore Society. His wide-ranging repertoire of English language songs and ballads include occupational and labor songs, children's songs, humor songs and parodies, Irish American songs, sea songs, religious songs, and chorus songs. Joe has three solo recordings, uh, Joe Hickerson with a Gathering of Friends, and Drive Dull Care Away, Volumes 1 and 2, and Joe is the first public folklorist, person who works in public folklore, who has a degree in folklore, so that's a, a wonderful thing to celebrate. Pat Jasper is a director of the Houston Folk Life and Traditional Arts Program at the Houston Arts Alliance. Pat has an MA in folklore from the University of Texas, Austin. Her work experience includes folklorist in residence for Austin Community Television, folk arts coordinator and field representative for the Texas Commission on the Arts, director of Texas Folk Life Resources. Some of her projects include the International Accordion Festival in San Antonio, the exhibition Country Music from the Lone Star State at the Texas State History Museum, Surviving Katrina and Rita in Houston, documentation project with the Library of Congress, and head curator for a celebration of Texas music, food and wine for the Smithsonian Folk Life Festival. Steve Zeitlin is a folklorist, filmmaker, writer, and cultural activist. He received his PhD in folklore and folk life from the University of Pennsylvania, and is a founding director of City Roar, an organization dedicated to fostering New York City and Americans' living cultural heritage. He has served as a commentator for public radio and is the author of numerous books on America's folk culture, including Because God Loves Stories, an anthology of Jewish storytelling, city play, and a volume of poetry, and also three books for young readers. Steve has documented, recorded, and fallen in love with carnival pitches, children's rhymes, family stories, subway stories, ancient cosmology, and oral poetry traditions from around the world. There are answers for this. Um, the first question is, what brought you to folklore? What does folklore mean to you? We're going to begin with Joe and work our way this way. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for this opportunity to reminisce. Uh, my interest in folklore started with folk songs. I was raised in New Haven, Connecticut, and I loved to sing. I even sang for money in the Episcopal Choir. I didn't play any instruments. My mother played piano and sang. My brother played piano, which is why I didn't touch it. And we had on the tape on the piano that we sang out of two folk song collections, folk song USA by John and Alan Lomax and the Fireside Book of Folk Songs. And my parents had some albums of 78s back when an album was an album, a group of recordings bound together like a photo album, Upper Lives, Carl Sandberg, all those things. And uh, I was in, kind of interested in the guitar sound but in 1949, I was smitten with the ukulele because of Arthur Godfrey's popularity. And my mother, who had paid a ukulele in college in the 20s, went out and bought one and left, left it lying around hoping that Joe would visit, which I didn't. And then I graduated to guitar, starting with my grandmother, my maternal grandmother from Texas guitar, which hadn't been strung in 30 years. Anyway. Um, I started writing folk songs, collecting recordings. I started collecting pop recordings in 1949. And uh, by 1950, I was learning a bunch of playing, singing them with my brother. My brother knew all the chords, and I was strumming them good. And one of the first songs I ever sang out outside of my closet was the following in 1950. And it came from that period when the Weavers, the folk song quartet, the Weavers, had extraordinary popularity. Irene, good night. Sing it. Irene, good night. Good night, Irene. Good night, Irene. I'll see you in my dreams. I'll just sing one verse because people don't know this person pretty much. I got it from the pages of Billboard magazine at the time. So the end of the popularity of Good Night, Irene, which was extremely long. <laughs> Stop rambling, stop your gambling, confess your sins and your faults. You'd still be singing good night, Irene, if 
Patty Page hadn't sung a Tennessee waltz in my time. Irene, good night. Irene, good night. Good night, Irene, good night, Irene. I'll see you in my dreams. Very good, very good. Are you up for some questions? Uh, well, during my high school days in New Haven in the early 50s, I expanded my repertory. I got kind of a reputation among friends as being kind of a folk singer. I had some friends who would join me, and we'd have a quartet, maybe perform once or twice. But I really didn't get exposed to what folk song activity was in the United States until I went to Oberlin College in September of 1953, because there were a bunch of kids from New York City who not only had guitar in their case, but people song book and the latest issue of Sing Out, it was volume three. So. Uh, anyway, I got instantly exposed to folk ways records, Pledge uh, Belly, Pete Seeger, et cetera, et cetera. Pete Seeger came every year, and it was kind of a trend, right? My freshman year, 200 people came. Next year, 400 people. Then 750, my senior year, over 1,000. Kind of a trend going on. I was right in the middle. And I got started talking to put on concerts. I was starting to sell records on the campus of Bookways and Stinson and Electra. At radio show, we formed the Oakland College Folk Song Club. And we formed a group of eight called the Folksmiths that toured the summer camps in the Northeast in 1957 and made a LP for uh, folk rays, and which has now shrunk wrapped into a CD. Uh, anyway, then something happened. I found out, and I'll discuss this later under coincidences, that I was, oh, I was majoring in physics, and I was kind of lackluster in applying to physics graduate schools. But I found out early my senior year that there was a place that and folklore, including folk music, and that was at university. I didn't tell my parents I applied, and I got this nice postcard from W. Edson Richmond, acting chair of the curriculum on folklore, as it was called then, accepting me. And I wrote home, dear folks, this one. <laughs> so that's how I got into folklore studies. I thought I'd start with a, with a brief anecdote that happened on the plane as I was coming to New York, uh, coming coming uh, here to New Orleans. Um, we were coming through Washington and a number of folklorists had gotten on the plane at, at the same time. And one of them was, well, actually I had never met before, she's somewhere at the meeting. And she was sitting in front of me and the man next to her was trying to strike up a conversation with her. And he said, what do you do? And she said, well, I'm a folklorist. He said, oh, is that an avocation? And she looked at him straight in the eye and said, no, it's a vocation. <laughs> thought that was very telling. Um, in, in, uh, in, in thinking about what brought me into folklore, one of the stories that I often tell about it is that I was studying old English literature, uh, getting a master's degree at Bucknell, and I was happened to be in the library at Penn because I had family in Philadelphia and I'd been undergraduate at Penn. And uh, I was wandering through the shelves one day, and I came across a book by Ben Botkin. And in thumbing through the Ben Botkin book, uh, I noticed that there were a set of children's rhymes collected for the WPA. Uh, you know, one of them, including a number by Ralph Ellison, that had been collected by Ralph Ellison for the WPA. And uh, I actually remember one of the rhymes which went, I should worry, I should care, I should marry a millionaire. He should die, I should cry, I should marry another guy. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and somehow I thought to myself, who is this person? This, this is exactly what I want to be doing. You know, this is a perfect job for me. And then coincidentally, I discovered soon after that you could get a PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, and that's how I ended up uh, doing that and having the wonderful first meeting with Kenny Goldstein, who told me, the first thing he told me was, listen, you have to understand something. Folklore is not a, a something you study. Folklore is a religion. And if you come to this department, you are one of its missionaries. <laughs> and, and that stayed with me uh, a long time. Um, uh, you know, in, in the deepest way, I think that the, the reason, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, but the reason I went into folklore is that it seemed to me the best profession to answer the question, what is the meaning of life? You know, I, I uh, 
And I, I somehow got some testament to that when I fell in love with a, an old Jewish story, which goes that there's a Jewish uh, yeshiva booker in the shtetl, and he's studying late one night, and he, he's studying by candlelight, and he wakes up, and, and he suddenly stands up in a fury and says, cries out, what is the meaning of life? And he goes running out into the town square, yelling, what is the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? People are coming out to the windows and telling him to shut up, and he's knocking on the rabbi's door, and the, the rebbe's and the rabbi's wife comes out, and she said, no, I need to talk to the rabbi. The rabbi comes in, he's putting his clothes on, and, uh, and he says, rabbi, I, I had to know, I had to wake you because I had to know, what is the meaning of life? And the rabbi smacks him. He said, why'd you smack me? Just because I woke you up, that's no reason to smack me. The rabbi said, that's not why I smacked you. This is the reason I smacked you. You had such a great question. Why did you have to demand an answer? <laughs> but, but going back long before that, uh, when I was growing up, I grew up in Brazil. And I grew up in a somewhat isolated uh, American family. And I had a very close relationship with my two brothers. And, um, and uh, we, my brother and I, developed a tradition of calling each other Yo Sire, um, and which we still to this day call each other Yo Sire. And somebody asked my brother once, why, why do you call each other Yo Sire? And uh, he answered, respect. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you know, I, I, I fell in love, we, you know, we, we, once I was, uh, I was uh, my brother was passing out chiclets, uh, and we were on the ground floor of this 15-story apartment building where we were at the beach. And, um, and instead of taking one, like I took six chiclets and put them all in my mouth, which is, you know, my, my love of excess of all kinds was illustrated there. And, and he, he said, well, why don't you just jump off the 15-story window for a breeze on a hot day? And uh, that became a family expression for all issues of excess. You know, why don't you jump off the 15-story window for, for a breeze on a hot day? And I started to, to, to think to myself that that's really... Even back then, when I was a kid, I thought, you know, that's, that seems to be what life is really about. That's really, uh, you know, where it, where it takes place. And I, I've actually tried to write a little bit about how when people get to know each other and the, and the closeness and the attachments they form with each other, uh, they oftentimes, you know, it's the closer you get to other people, the more you're, you're, you artify your speech and your speech becomes a form of poetry. Uh, because you're, you're constantly compressing experience into shorter and shorter language. Um, and, I, and I became to realize, you know, in that, that our lives, you know, we experience in concentric circles. That the outer circle is the work of artists who we don't know personally. The writers we love and read, the movies, novels, and the songs. We have concentric circles also of acquaintances, friends, and family. And the story of our, and humor of our own inner circles is particularly charged because art and creativity, the art and creativity is tied to memory, love, passion, person-to-person -person immediacy, ripened with time. As my son, Ben, uh, Ben Zeitlin, now the, now the illustrious director, said in, in an interview with, with the Times, he said, from my parents, I learned that art is as much in the humor that we find in jokes around the dinner table than anything you could find in a museum. Whereas our society believed that the outer circle of great and agreed upon masterpieces are the core form of art, folklorists consider the inner circle, the art of everyday life, to be the core. And whereas literature and other masterworks can move us deeply through their intrinsic beauty, we know they have moved us when they give us goosebumps or become metaphors and reference points for our own lives. They can give us perspective and help us shape the way we view our own life story, but our life story always takes precedence. So that's some of what drew me into the field. That's a pretty tough act to follow. I can't sing. <laughs> I don't have all your stories. Uh, yeah, I think I came into I came into folklore like uh, many public sector folklorists came through the 1976 uh, bicentennial. It was then called uh, American Folklore Festival. And I came to it through pure serendipity. Um, I was um, doing an exhibition in, uh, in Washington, D.C. I was actually uh, trying to get this exhibition going for my youngest sister. And in doing so, you know, you talk to everybody because you really want everybody to come to it. And I met Maria Teresa O'Leary. Maria Teresa O'Leary is a Mexican who owned the Nuevo Mundo uh, boutique shop down in Alexandria, Virginia. And uh, we made friends, 
and somebody from the Smithsonian came to her and said, oh, we're looking for a Mexican, we're looking for a Mexican-born Mexican. Uh, do you know anybody? And she recommended me to be a cultural liaison. Now, this is a role that uh, Lane, uh, that uh, Ethel Rain concocted, suggested, recommended. Uh, Bicentennial uh, Smithsonian was bringing uh, people from many different countries to the festival. They thought it was really great, important to bring, to have somebody, a nanny, to um, be part of the group, you know, with Mac Allen with the Mexicans, to just hang around with them, take care of them. You know, they get headaches, they have toothaches, they you know, have different ways of looking for things. So anyway, that's how I came to be the cultural liaison, the nanny for the Bicentennial, and I worked with uh, 20, 23 musicians and two dancers, representing the uh, Mexican song traditions of different regions of Mexico. And it was an eye opener. This is me uh, learning about my culture on the National Mall. Um, and I, to my surprise, I discovered that there is such a discipline as folklore. So then my very good colleagues said, Mexican ethnomusicologist, Ms. Musicologist, uh, Irene Vasquez, she had done the field work for the program, and John McDonald. My John McDonald had just graduated. He was going to go over to Indiana to become a teacher. And uh, they armed me with my first mini bibliography. So I got to read Vicente Mendoza and Don Américo Paredes. A couple of years later, and I think uh, Steve was part of this, uh, Jack Santino decided to dangle the carrot and said, hey, how would you like to take a folk life course? So he started a program at George Washington University. And we were his first students, and I took a course from Steve as well. And of course, um, Jack, he was a great teacher. I mean, he, I don't know anybody else who teaches myth. And the one we were reading, the Gilda Meshepic and Superman. Well, he, got, he got my attention there. So the other question was, well, you know, what does folklore mean to me? You know, uh, folklore is a word I don't use. Um, I like folk life. Usually, uh, the trying to understand, you know, trying to think through, you know, what does it mean to me? I think of the uh, many times that I have had to go down and work with anthropologists down in Colombia, anthropologists in Mexico City, and other, you know, musicologists, and explain to them because they're going to collaborate with me in doing. Uh, festival. I'm trying to um, explain to them what we're looking for. We're looking for folklore, and so I can't use that term as cultura popular is usually in any Latin American country. How do I translate folklore? Well, what I really try to do is say, I want you to, be, I want you to work with me in talking to people who tap their knowledge, their practices, their aesthetics, their their uh, experiences, to connect to history, to connect to identity, to connect to place. And I see, uh, I've always seen folklore as very performative. And when I say performative, to me, it's as performative for a uh, mule packer, packing his mule, to a singer singing. So that's a little bit of where I come from. My arrival story, there's a lot of arrival story. You can, you can come from many different angles, and this one is very much sort of inspired by Karina. Thank you, Rubina. Rubina, thank you so much for this opportunity. Um, I'm kind of wildly flattered to be uh, up here with these individuals. Um, their work is really, has been so substantial uh, in various aspects of the field, particularly in public folklore. But I am personally pretty mortified to be referred to as a leader in the field. Um, so I just want to preface my comments along those lines. But it's, it's interesting to me to kind of relay the story of how I found my way to folklore because it was a combination of religion, uh, passion, and you know, intellectual search. I, like many of us, uh, found my way initially to kind of the default um, intellectual endeavor that had a substantial aesthetic component, and that was that I wanted to study English literature. Um, I actually happened to attend, as an undergraduate, what I love to refer to as a now-defunct experimental college, 
but it was perfectly legitimate to fund experimental college because in fact, our fellow folklorist, who is the current director of the American Folk Life Center at the Library of Congress, is also a graduate of that now defunct experimental <laughs> college. Um, so, in fact, she's also a graduate of the exact same high school that I went to. Can you imagine Betsy Peterson and Pat Jasper going to high school together? <laughs> no, you can't imagine that, can't you? Um, but I was in English literature. I became, of course, very interested in the question of how across many different literary systems, the same genres seem to assert themselves. Um, I was interested in the question of the impulse to epic across different linguistic communities, the, the lyrical voice and how it seemed to manifest itself in many different linguistic traditions, uh, the way the ballad form um, continued to pop up. Um, and I, I wanted some more tools than than literary criticism could give you to address that question. I wanted to, to know why those forms were substantial across so many cultural communities, not just European ones. Um, so I, of course, drifted at my now defunct experimental college to anthropology and was introduced um, to the work of Clifford Gertz and uh, his work, of course, kind of seeing the entire world as an aesthetic universe uh, was very enlightening. So I, I actually uh, got a double degree as an undergraduate in English and Anthropology and knew that I wanted to go forward um, doing further work in this kind of fusion intellectually. So I actually, I think it's a 22 year old, I was trying to figure this out the other day, made a trek to Mexico City to the AAA cons uh, conference uh, to, to meet Clifford Gantz. And I believe, and I'm trying to remember whether I put this together in my mind or not, uh, I believe Roger Abrams was on a panel with him. Um, but what I discovered in the field of anthropology uh, was that unlike the field of English literature, though it had many mechanisms for looking at cultural pattern, I felt that anthropology really had a great deal of difficulty dealing with aesthetic culture. And for me, really, that's kind of the answer to why I ended up in folklore and why, what I think folklore is. I really think folklore is aesthetic culture. I know there are many different aspects of our work that are not as overtly artful as others, but I think that what we really do seek is that notion of a pattern and form and the beauty of the simple to the complex act. Um, I guess I also wanted to just add, and this is this is a little bit of a footnote. Because I was in a now defunct experimental college, um, our work really was very wide ranging. So in addition to doing standard literary studies, I also was introduced to the avant-garde and um, I find interestingly that the avant-garde of the arts shares a great deal with our interests in the aesthetic forms of traditional communities um, and interest in pattern and repetition and parallelism, things that can be very artfully wrought. Um, and I was drifting as one often does when one's about 22 towards becoming a poet. Um, that was not very long lived. I don't have a very good sense of uh, delayed gratification, but, um, but at that point in time, ethnopoetics was very, very hip in the field of American poetry. And for those of you who don't know anything about ethnopoetics, it was, it was forwarded by a poet named Jerome Rothenberg. Um, and you would think that what it really was was about you know, looking at poetic traditions across cultural communities, but what it really was was older white men appropriating uh, the artistic forms of cultures that they admired from afar and attempting to sort of replicate them in um, these standard settings. And, you know, I, I, I was drifting into poetry as that was happening, and it really struck me that um, that was exactly what I was not interested in. What I really wanted to do was have some purchase on the very communities themselves. And I felt that purchase 
resided in their words and not in my representations of them. So I think I'll stop there. I just want to remind everybody that we have been uh, in the past and in the future we'll be sitting in a panel in which these folks are talking about some of the study, but this is a really rare opportunity to get to hear them talk about themselves and their lives. And I think that's what's great about this particular panel and that this will be, is entering the permanent record. It will be something that we and a few as follows for the future can come and look at. So I want to actually remember to thank Tim Lloyd and Maureen Cashman for uh, making it possible for us to be able to put this uh, transcript into the archive. The second question that um, I had asked you to think about is what were some key influences or inspirations for you that led you in this path of your career? These could be teachers, works, scholarly works, or informants. So we're actually going to go now in the reverse order, Pat, Olivia, Steve, and Joe. So um, key influences, inspirations for you. Well, goodness. Um, it is true that when I, I'm so sorry to keep doing this, graduated from the now defined experimental college, <laughs> maybe I can find an acronym for it, I was given a copy of Singer of Tales. And that is really pretty much the book that made me understand that there was a world out there that I came to know eventually. Did you just lose? I think we did. Um, that there was a, a, an intellectual uh, endeavor met my interests. Um, and I also just, as a matter of happenstance, well, this is the problem. It's, it's <laughs> because we're all pulling on it. Um, I, I did, in fact, as a matter of happenstance, uh, move to Austin, Texas, out of the blue, not to attend the University of Texas. And because I knew I was going to go on in my studies, I enrolled in some courses. and. The very, one of the very first courses I took at the University of Texas was Introduction to Folklore with Richard Bauman. And it pretty much changed my life and changed the course of things and made me uh, very much who I am. But I want to say this. There are certainly scholars and teachers who have played an incredibly important part in my development as a folklorist and the work I've been able to achieve. But I think equally important is the whole notion of peers and how peers inform the work you do and how your intellectual cohorts form who you are. And I was at the University of Texas at a ridiculously wonderful time. Um, the first person I met the very first day of graduate school was Kay Turner. And uh, it took us a little while to become fast friends, but uh, sure enough we did. And, um, and individuals like Kay, uh, Betsy Peterson, Deborah Kodish, who followed a year later, were an amazing influence on the work that I was able to do because we, uh, Deborah was earlier trying to remember how Roger Rennick referred to all of us, and it was always some version of you are to this or to that. I think Kay was designated as too creative. Um, <laughs> but we were all aligned intellectually, but we were, we had our own interests, and there was this kind of drive to push each other to, to, to new levels. And that, that is a set of relationships that went from graduate school into my professional life. And I would literally have to say that there is nothing that has been more formative than those collegial and peer relationships. There are great works and great teachers that inform everything. And, and every day of my work life, I use the work that I did as a graduate student and the readings I have done as a folklorist in my work, but every bit as much the people I got to work alongside of as a, a young intellectual and then as a young folklorist and now even as an old folklorist um, are really, they've really pushed me. And, and last but not least, I wanted to mention, and this, is a, this is, was an interesting development for me, um, Olivia read Americo Paredes. Um, I studied with Americo Paredes. He was a remarkable professor um, in a kind of interesting way. I mean, we used to all laugh. Um, he would assign us in a class called Materials and Methods One, Introduction to Folklore Theory, between 500 to 2,500, 500 to 2,500 pages of reading every week. 
And every week, we would uh, write a pricey on the basis of what our readings had been for that week. Um, and that was truly when I learned the oral formulaic method. Um, <laughs> I literally would make a vow to myself, and that was this was back in you know uh, typewriter days, and I can only uh, I, I cannot I can only peck out my typing, but um, I would make the vow that when the page went in, the page did not come out until it was finished, no going back. Um, but Paredes, he was that kind of figure. He really drove us to master the material. But I bring him up even more importantly because as a public folklorist, his work so informs the work that I have gone on to do. And it, I wasn't as close to him as a graduate student. There was an incredible um, group of young Chicano folklorists who were very, very close to him during their period of study. And, and I was certainly part and parcel of the crowd, but I wasn't as close to him as, as many of them were. But as my work proceeded as a public folklorist, his example for, for connecting with communities and using their traditions and the traditions of his own community to really unpack to the world the enormous misconceptions uh, they were capable of generating just has always been uh, a, a part of how I feel my public work has been informed. So uh, I just wanted to end on that point. Yeah, I had to go back to uh, Irene Vasquez Valle, a Mexican ethnomusicologist, and she modeled what I think we would call now cultural democracy. Here's a person that lived her life out, out, in, out in the communities uh, recording the Mexican musicians, and she had many a chance. She was, uh, one time she was uh, married to a uh, Brooksman. Anyway, uh, she spent her, rather than climbing the hierarchies of intellectual life in Mexico, she stayed out in the field recording. And her thing was to go and record the musicians in their own communities. Uh, and uh, she had this way about her at the festival. This is where I really experienced her. Being with those musicians as colleagues, as friends. They were not just the performers that we were going to bring on stage. These were, these were her two friends. And this, humor she had, and she taught me something very important about ethics and the kind of work we do. And that has stayed with me forever and ever. Of course, then uh, we, I've got to come back and mention Américo Paredes. He inspired me in many ways. He was a uh, Don Américo, a great gentleman. Um, but he inspired me to look at my own community. Here I was, and finally I did, uh, uh, working for a PhD in American Studies at George Washington University. And everybody is writing about the forming of community and going to the 19th century, you know, the Italians, the Irish, on and on. And I, here I'm sitting in Washington, D.C. and looking around, this is the 1970s. There is a community forming right around me. There is a Latino community, a very young community. And I say, well, why don't we look at the process of forming community, which is happening right around me? And that's, but this is very much due to Domenico Paredes, and of course, here's a conjunction out here. You know, I got, I got the bug with the Smithsonian Folklife Festival, so the festival really stuck in me, and I was always teasing, you know, I'm gonna write my dissertation on the Latino Festival. And yes, uh, our Gillette says, hey, you know, how about writing on the Latino Festival? I said, are you, sh are you serious? And again, this comes back to understanding what folklore is. I mean, through the Latino Festival, here is, you know, I learned a lot about the community, how it organizes, how it forms, how it defines itself. Identity, identity was big then. Identity is so big now. So that's pretty much, you know, Amerigo has influenced me in a very strange, indirect way. Getting onto the festival idea, uh, you know, I, from very early on, uh, reading Roger Abrams, uh, Dick Bauman, Richard Schechner, Dale Himes, and this kept giving me those, those intellectual tools in American studies, 
with Dr. Blatch, who's my great, great, great advisor, but he never liked any of this stuff that had to do with semiotics. He was very tolerant. <laughs> I thank him very much. I even had to run off to Indiana for a semiotics institute. One of those, I forget what year it was, it was just great, Roberto Eco, Mary Douglas, Dick Baumann, uh, Beverly Stoji. John Blatch put up with me. But when I really think about um, the influences, the people that have shaped me, I would say, I really have to go to the people that I've worked with. I have to go back to Colonel Harris, the uh, maroon colonel from uh, Jamaica, who, for me, I learned how kept his autonomy, how through his traditions he connects to history. I have to go back to Don Ophelia Santos. Don Ophelia Santos was a migrant uh, living in Tijuana. She never quite made it across the border. Uh, who went and organized all the Mixteca women and non Mixtecas through the wanted, and took over a plaza and turned it into a vendor's sector. We would ask Ophelia, she came to the festival. All these people came to the festival at some point. We would ask Ophelia, um, well, how long did it take you, you know, tell us how, well, how long it took you to get to uh, Tijuana. She was actually going to cross the border, but a lot of uh, immigrants stopped at the border and create new communities there. And I expected a question like, well, you know, three days, eight days, six years. She was a migrant to, from Oaxaca, she migrated to Michoacan, from Michoacan she went over to Mexico City, oh, she went to Veracruz too, and so you, know, you learn a lot. You learn a lot about, about life, what questions she should ask. I'm still learning from them what questions she should ask. Uh, Julio Quispe. Here's, you know, while we're looking at culture and development in Latin America, this is a program that I did with the Inter-American Foundation. He's a weaver. Everybody's a weaver in his uh, island. He lives in a tequila. Tequila, tequila is an island in Lake Titicaca, the only uh, Quechua-speaking people in this whole Aymara area. And uh, of course, they were brought in by the Incas, because they're great farmers. This is an area where you can't grow fruits very high, and you can still manage to grow corn. He was introduced to me by uh, my colleague, Kevin Healy, who was a Peace Corps, co Peace Corps worker. You know, the Peace Corps did wonderful things to Americans. So he arrives there, you know, Kevin arrives in Taquile to teach the Taquileños how to farm. <laughs> well, they took all his seeds, you know, got their room. Anyway, here's like, uh, Julio, Julio who has connects to a history that is History that we never know. He, uh, in their island, in their island was turned into a political prisoner's prison. And one of the political prisoners, later on became president of Peru, said, well, why don't you just die? Why don't you do? Of course, they kept the Indians, the to take care of the prisoners. Why don't you buy your island? Julio Quispes and grandparents bought the island now here they have a sustainable tourism area where you know you, to get to the island you have to use their boats. And in the island, uh, every well the people, the families that have decided to contribute to be part of the experiment have all built little rooms next to their houses, and it would have to be pretty hard to be a tourist there. So, so you know these are the people that have taught me. What am I really asking? I mean, when I say, oh, you know, I want to go know your stories, I want to know your food ways. There's a lot, a lot of different ways of asking these questions and just you know, going to show me you know, what skills you know, what are your, what is your repertoire. And I can go on and on. I've, you know, it's, I mean, it's been a blessing to work for the Folk Life Festival and to meet incredible women. This farmer from Bolivia up in the highlands, out in uh, Boyacá, whose mother has been a potter, her grandmother has been a potter, they're all potters. What is she doing? She is making virgins, virgins with faces that are Andean faces. And she is, hey, you know, great pottery. Respect the tradition. My mother taught me how to make pots. You know, that's the traditional way to make it. She's making these virgins that are, at some point, would have say outside the tradition. But no, they're very much at the heart of what we should be uh, learning about. And I don't know. I, mean, I, you know, I had to do my last program, which I was not going to curate this year. East of the river, this is Anacostia, this is black DC. It was transformative. And you know, from Chris Dials and the boom, 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 
And what was fascinating there was to see, of course, all the flag he showed up, which is very nice. You don't always do that at the festival. Um, see Chris Stiles, who had participated in an earlier program, become mentored to the other performers in how to present themselves. You know, at the festival, that's yet another, an, an, another angle of, you know, of public folklore. The art of representation and then how do you, how do you uh, think about what you're doing and break frame for your audience so they can understand it. Next. <laughs> Well, you know, it's just to mention three of the great women that have inspired me in the field. Um, Barbara KG and Barbara Meyerhoff were incredible inspirations for me. We were working on the Grand Generation and got together with them for a consultants meeting and had the, I had the pleasure of seeing Barbara Meyerhoff and Barbara both kind of, you know, showing all their, their petticoats and where they had gotten all these great bargains to, to buy these various uh, items of, of vintage clothing that they've been able to put their hands on. Um, and, uh, and of course, Bess, uh, Bess Hawes, you know, we, uh, all three of those women are, are people that, you know, sometimes when I'm trying to do a project and finishing, I think, uh, I hope they would have thought I did okay. You know, I wish, I wish you just, you know, I hope they thought I lived up to it, especially Bess, because she had funded so many of these programs. <laughs> I still think, oh my God, Bess, you think I, you think you, you think we did okay? You think we earned the, the money that we were given to do this? And of course, uh, Bess is in the, the, this film on girls hand clapping games, and one of the last interviews she ever did that's we're showing on Saturday. So I think of her all the time when I see her on the screen. And and of course, one of Bess's ideas was the importance of field work, and the field work is the backbone of our field, and. Um, one of Barbara KG's ideas that she talked about one time is how, how advocacy for communities can sometimes distort inquiry. Uh, another important idea, both of which I take very much to heart, and those ideas are at the core of what I do. But uh, like Olivia, the, the, the real inspirations for me, and something that I've come to try to think about a lot is, is, uh, is, is the uh, effect of the people I work on, and, and what that relationship is between the folklorist and the people they're working with. I, I feel like we should banish the term informant from the discipline. Um, they're really our collaborators. Uh, we're, we're collaborating with people to accomplish a shared, a shared end. Um, and and uh, I put a great stop on the personal effect and meaning and friendship that I formed with the people that we work with. Um, we've talked, I try to think about it sometimes in terms of solidarity, and connection across difference. Uh, that's a concept I was talking about with Jack Chen, the idea of connecting across difference. And uh, uh, I also think of the people that I work with as being kindred spirits uh, that, that are somehow connected to me in some profound way that go beyond our stations and not, you know, beyond our circumstances in life. And that it, it, if, you know, one of the one of the people I got very close to was a man named Tony Butler, who was a homeless man who lived on the subways, and was kind of a homespun philosopher who claimed that you know the whole world is my home. You know, I'm not homeless. The whole world is my home, and the only way I'm leaving this home is when God kicks me out of it. You know, so so um, there are people like that. Uh, one of the things that, of course, I ended up being the one who took him to the hospital. You know, Margaret uh, Morton, a friend of mine, was photographing the structures of the homeless on the Lower East Side. Was photographing a Chinese man who built these homemade structures, and you know, ultimately, she was the one who who had to bury him because she was the nearest of kin. Um, I'm very close, working with a woman who made a wonderful documentary called *The Cats of Murakatani*, about a homeless Japanese artist who she found on the streets, and she made that film 15, 20 years ago, and she was. You know, she couldn't work for us for a few days because she was in the hospital taking care of him because she was the only, she was his caretaker. So these relationships are, are very close. And um, part of the, um, the idea of this, uh, one of the wonderful, highest compliments that I've ever been paid was by my friend Mark Kaminsky, who uh, called me a poetic listener. And I, I feel like we all strive to be poetic listeners. And he, he described uh, Barbara Meyerhoff as, as, as who, who thought of listening, quote, 
as something akin to soul flight, a period of grace when she was granted the gift of leaving her own life to travel in another's. Um, you know, I think of, of one of the, my most profound friends, uh, Fred Blegler, we brought to the festival many times who would, would travel with uh, geek shows in the 1920s and, and was this incredible uh, poet uh, whose poems would, would uh, describe things like Neola the geek who proceeds to, quote, devour and suck every drop of blood from that bleeding, quivering, pulsating body with the very same relish as you or I would suck the juice of, her, of an orange. It's one of the most disgusting, one of the most repulsive, yet I'll say one of the most interesting sights you've seen in all your life. Uh, and we would always quote, as he put it, bring him out of retirement one more time to tell those stories at the Smithsonian Festival or at the uh, Traveling Medicine Show program in New York and many, many other programs. And I didn't hear from him for a few years. And of course, you know, when I, when I got a call from his wife saying that he had passed away, you know, I just closed the door in my office and left. It just, it just, it just was such a profound relationship and profound friendship that we had between us. Um, and it's made me think a lot about that, that, that relationship, which is really such an inspiring one. One of the uh, anecdotes that I like to tell about Alan Lomax was that I met him at a party early on when I was a graduate student. And um, he told me, he came up to me, we both had a drink in our hand, he said, you know, Steve, I discovered um, Muddy Waters, uh, Lead Belly, who have you discovered? <laughs> I didn't have the good sense to say, well, how about Tony, the, the homeless guy on the subway? I discovered him. You know, and uh, I think a lot about the lines that was once said by the Beatles when, they, when, uh, you see, they, they, when John Lennon was asked you know, about Brian Epstein, their manager. And he, people always say that Brian Epstein discovered the Beatles. He didn't discover the Beatles. The Beatles discovered Brian Epstein. Um, and I realized, too, that you know, Alan didn't discover Muddy Waters. Muddy Waters discovered Alan Lomax. Uh, in lots of ways, and uh, and I, I oftentimes wonder about why, for instance, certain folklorists have become the documenters and uh, I guess uh, praise singers, if you will, uh, of certain people. Obviously, they're connected in some way. Why did you know? Why did Alan end up being so closely associated, working so closely with Lead Belly? You know, what was it in their entirely different? Careers that somehow link them together in some way, or or Ralph Rinsler and Doc Watson. You know what was the connection, or, or John Cohen and Roscoe Holcomb. You know, there's obviously certain ways in which people are drawn to work together and study, you know, one and and collaborate with each other on shared ends. And it's a very profound relationship, and it's something that I find to be an endless source of inspiration in this field. Thank you. Uh, once again, I'm Joe Hickerson, and uh, let me talk about five, five different people. The first, uh, when I was at Oberlin College in the mid-1950s, there was a student from New York City who was two years older than I was. His name was Stephen B. Toller, and he was kind of the folk music entrepreneur on campus. He had the agency, so folk race records and electron and Stinson records on campus. He had the folk radio show, he organized Beat Seeker concert, uh, and so on and so forth. And when he graduated, he passed all of that, all that to me. And uh, he was very careful in making sure I was up on what was in the catalog of the record companies, and insisted I look at the notes, like Ken Goldstein and others. <laughs> and uh, just a wonderful guy, the best man in Germany. And uh, next, yeah, Indiana University, the whole Indiana University experience was certainly collectively influential and totally absorbing. Let me single out one event, and that was the Folklore Institute of the summer of 1958. Folklore Institute at that time was an eight-week session that occurred every fourth summer. The last one was in 1962. This was 1958. I lived in a house, 509 East Cottage Grove. Um, my roommate was Ed Khan, Ed Khan. Uh, in the next apartment was Ellen Steckert and Ricky Sherover. Across the hall was Frank Hoffman and Kenny Goldstein. Also, Ellen had a large kitchen, a heating area, so the, uh, we not only had Archer Taylor there all for all eight weeks, 
a whole series of folklores that pass through for two days, three days. And uh, invariably, they'd end up for one meal with all of us at the uh, 509 East College School. I got to appreciate not only the community at Indian University, but the community of folklorists around the country and around the world. And often these folklorists were just were mavericks in their situations. They were the only folklorists in their department. And uh, you know, it, was, it was very unusual to have a place with more than one folklorist. I came to work at the Library of Congress Archival Folk Song in 1963. And uh, let me single out a person who very much impressed me, partly because he was so little known at the time, and I was the first director of the archive, a man named Robert Winslow Gordon, who had studied at Harvard with George Simon Kittredge, as you all seem to have done. And uh, his impressive array of collecting and of indexing, and then his very strong interest in association with folk songs that he found with popular songs before and after, and what the, the whole uh, relationship of the way songs pass from one kind of transmission to another, call it what you will, uh, really impressed him. Really, he sought to explore and collect information. Um, among the few people I got time, people said, oh, you work like your car's folk archive, you go out in the field all the time. He says, no, there were so many people who gone out in the field before, we had so much stuff, and so few staff to take care of it, and help the people who wanted to use it. But I did get to spend some time with a man named Fields Ward, who lived uh, northeast of uh, Baltimore. He had moved up there during the war from his home in Galax, Virginia. And he spoke to me lovingly of his family and community. The idea that he wasn't just a singer, you know, just knew some songs. And the materials that he had in his home, his father had written out four ballad books, songs written longhand. And for the for the family, and his, his mother compiled scrapbooks, and he had wonderful stories about the community. The people in Lerma, particularly his chief mentor, was not a member of his family, but Uncle Eck Dunford, who told him, "You want people to understand you. Come on, pronounce those words, get them out clearly, and use your own voice when you sing. And don't go into one of those twangs or anything like that." The one, the last thing I'll mention has to do with these people. Informants, we used to generally call them. Uh, one of the unique things that happened at the Iger Congress Folk Archive was in 1941. They had established the Professional Recording Laboratory with the first director, Jerome Wiesner, who later became president of MIT. But as the old timers used to say, yeah, we gave Jerry his first job. Uh, they wanted to issue some recordings, some recordings from the field collections of the Archive of American Folk Song. Now, no public institution, government institution in the world had ever done this, so it's no precedent. One of the things, I'm sure there were many meetings about this and memos, and one of the things that was decided was remarkable, and that is, what do you do about permissions? Well, the collectors are mostly working for the library, so that's public domain. Your federal employee can't the songs are old and beyond copyright. Are there any rights? They decided that they would not issue anybody's voice without written permission of that per per person or next of kin or documentation that they tried to get. In 1941. One of, one of the, um, let's see how, how I'll start that. I guess one of the uh, 
things I've been thinking about lately, which is that the very, the very uh, first definition, one of the first definitions I came across of tradition, and of the idea of tradition, was not uh, something told to me by, by a, uh, but not something I actually got from the field, but from, a, from, some soci from two sociologists named Bossard and Bowl, who had written a, a book about family traditions. And they said simply that tradition is what we like about ourselves and wish to continue. And I always thought that was such a simple, easy concept to grasp. And I, I kind of liked it because it, it didn't take itself too seriously and didn't embroil us in many discussions about what was or wasn't traditional and how we could uh, possibly work our way around it. Um, you know, one of the concepts, I mean, just to, to go through some of the ways in which I've kind of tried to construct meaning in the work we do. Uh, I go back oftentimes and quote in almost everything I write uh, somewhere, or other, somewhere or other in the work, Delhan's idea that folklore is about shaping deeply felt values into meaningful forms. Uh, I also uh, oftentimes end up quoting a psychologist named David Taylor who wrote, our greatest desire, greater even than the desire for happiness, is that our lives mean something. This desire for meaning is the original impulse of story. And um, the idea of story and what it means uh, is an organizing concept for me. And one of the anecdotes that has become emblematic of how I think about the field came when I was just uh, first started going into the field. I came across one of my college uh, roommates named uh, Ross Abrams. And uh, he had already gotten married a few years after college, and he had a son. And um, I said to him, you know, Saul, do you ever tell bedtime stories to your, to your son? And uh, he said, you know, do you ever make up bedtime stories for your son? He said, you know, Steve, it's a funny thing. You know, I started off, I told him all the different uh, folk tales that I could remember, Snow White and Cinderella, and Puss in Boots. You know, I told them all. Then one night, I ran out of stories to tell him. And, uh, I didn't quite know what to do, so I started instead telling him the story of his own day. And I started off, you know, Saul woke up, in this, woke up this morning and he had a bowl of Cheerios for breakfast. And he went outside, he waited for the school bus, and he came home, and then he had Kraft macaroni and cheese for lunch. And, uh, and he said, Steve, the funny thing is, after that, the only story he ever wanted to hear was the story of his own day. I, I, I kind of felt that this is the, the ultimate example of uh, storification, the art of, way we order, artify our lives. Um, I kind of, I expressed it as if, uh, in a poem, that, as if uh, written by that child. Once upon a time, my father, plumb out of fairy tales, fashioned a tale about a boy named Saul, who wolfed down his Cheerios and waited for the school bus, came home to craft macaroni and cheese, and it took me a moment to comprehend that child was me, but it became my favorite bedtime story. The wolf and warp of days braided each night before my dad and I would part, wound by a childhood charmer who spun life into art. Uh, the transformation of life into art is at the root of all storytelling, memoir, autobiography, myth-making, and, legend and legendary. As a number of writers have put it, we write to order the mess. The randomness of the world is ordered through art and storytelling. Finding moments of artfulness and giving them the self-contained structure of a story or a poem or a picture or a tale that is told sets them apart from the chaos of life and bespeaks permanence. Uh, you know, I've always believed, and I think every folklorist believes, that everybody is an artist whether they know it or not. Everybody tells stories, jokes, cooks, dances and celebrates, if nothing else. And I'm fascinated with the crannies where the aesthetics of life are nestled. I'm fascinated, for instance, when Sheila, the highly sought after hairstylist in my hometown, tells me that when she's cutting a person's hair, even, she, even, even if she hasn't cut it in many years, and even if many hairstylists have worked on since, she can still sense her own haircut in the hair. Her style is that distinctive. I once cut your hair, didn't I, she'll ask, but that was years ago, and I've had thousands of haircuts since. He said, how did you remember that? She says, you always know your cut. <laughs> and I just thought, you know, somehow that, that, that uh, <laughs> says, says a tremendous amount. I mean, I, one of the things I'm, I'm grateful for, of course, I never really get to uh, talk about these philosophical ideas uh, 
in, uh, in public settings. <laughs> but I, and I, what sometimes I call them my, my uh, cracker, barrel, cracker Barrel philosophies. But since you're giving me a chance to do that, uh, this is one of the uh, stray thoughts that I had on, on, that, on that ground. On the seventh day, that God didn't rest, perhaps, but instead, without the necessary physical exertion of creating, creating planets, stars, trees, animals, and human beings, the great being lay back and spun the gossamer thin structures of meaning. So the universe was replete, not just with the fishes and sea, the fowl in the air, not just Adam and Eve, but the impulse towards stories and poems and drawings that would one day fill the planet. Maybe God created beauty on his day of rest. That was the day of leisure for God to imagine and dream. True, a little whimsical. But among those structures of meaning, perhaps, are heaven and hell themselves. Grand religious ideas with endless artistic elaborations, which enable human beings who believe or don't believe in them to conceive of eternity and make it part of our short lives. It's always seemed far-fetched for me to imagine a creator who created humans in order for us to pray for him or wait for heaven to find true meaning. It's far easier for me to conceive that human, humans receive God-given tools for the purpose of creating meaning, and that is our God-given task. Our creativity, then, mirrors the act of creation. There are many good things to accomplish in this world, but to make something out of nothing, that's something. There are two, uh, well, our, one of the first courses we took in my first year in graduate school at Indiana University in folklore uh, was taught by Richard M. Dorsey, who had just arrived on campus two days before I did, September of 1957 and he unveiled his 10 theories and techniques of folklore over two semesters. The two that particularly stuck with me or has are archiving and bibliography. Now, bibliography, that was interesting because we each were assigned a state. We chose a state and approved. I took Vermont. We handed them in, and then he spent the whole two-hour session and the next session telling us how to do a bibliography. I mean, well, if you're going to have the author first, first name here, first, and last name, don't you want to do that for the second? <laughs> Consistency of format. That was, a, that was the call that I took all the way to the Library of Congress for the, I don't know how many hundreds of bibliographies, and bibliographic entries I compiled over the years, and the many, many interns who helped make these bibliographic entries, it was 50% content. You want to get the word spelled correctly. And 50% format. That format has to be 100% consistent. The other is archiving, and that uh, I just took to archiving. I, I had already worked. I was a record librarian. I worked in a library shelf books. In Oakland College, or, I got to, my first year there, I got a job under George Lewis in the Archives of Folk and Primitive Music. My cousin Hal, who's an anthropologist, been there for several years, a friend of Joe, said, my cousin Joe is coming, uh, you got a business for I said, well, what can you do? I mean, well, I need folk music, he does this and that, what can he type? My cousin immediately said, yes, not what I could. So that was my first professional, as it were, archival experience, what is now called the archive of traditional music. Um, but then for three years, I was director of the IU Folklore Archive, which was primarily manuscript collection. And uh, compiled indexes, and uh, had some assistants who I trained. And then I went to the work for the Library of Congress. I mean, I lucked out. I got a job. I got a day job. Well, we'll get into that. Uh, last one. I got a day job. In, in what I like to do, and uh, so I added to my ideas about archiving and bibliography. Uh, that's where it started. Uh, it's a little difficult not to repeat some of the things that my colleagues have uh, said. But uh, definitely, uh, in terms of the organizing principles of my work over the last uh, three decades, basically, um, 
I do go back to sort of those very early interests that continue to assert themselves in the field work I do, in the programming I do, um, and in the kind of uh, interpretive work that uh, those programs engage in. And that is really looking at the beauty of, of everyday life, looking at the aesthetic patterns um, that inform the simplest to the most complex actions. And uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting and daunting task, and we all know it. It's, it's kind of amazing to me that I spend my career being told that I have the best job in the whole world, and yet why aren't there more of us? Um, but, but yes, that, that basic notion of getting at the aesthetic impulse in so much of what we do and using the opportunities that the work I do uh, create for educating people to look for that in cultural action and practice and tradition. I also feel like as a public folklorist, it's really important for me to uh, lead with this notion of tradition, not, and, and for us this is a very simplistic idea, but given the fact that I work with the public and people who don't know a thing about folklore, I'm very aware that I have to, and in almost all the work I do, be certain that I find ways to communicate the tradition is not just an automatic response to an external stimulus. That tradition and cultural traditions that inform communities um, are cultural strategies, they're resources, and they are so because they work. They name a situation, they name it well, they create a way to respond that, that is productive and produces value in a community. And uh, so for me, that's very much an organizing principle in the, in the way I try to do the work that I do for public consumption. Uh, and then, of course, this whole notion of community. Um, community is such a complex idea, and yet the word falls on people very simply. And um, right now, for instance, I'm working in Houston, Texas, and believe it or not, y'all having the time of my life. Um, and it has recently been proclaimed the single most diverse city in the United States. Move over, New York. Um, and by that, what they mean is that it is, uh, in, in terms of the big sort of supposed ethnic categories, Latino, African and African American, uh, European ethnics, and uh, Asians, there's, a, there's a, the greatest sort of even spread within that city. But what that city doesn't know about itself, uh, I mean, it's, it's very, very proud of that. And, um, and in, in some interesting ways, for as long a conservative legacy as a city like Houston has had, it is a city that has done very little of the contemporary pushback that's going on uh, in many places in America against um, non, uh, non-white communities. Um, but what, but what the city of Houston doesn't fully understand is the communities within its communities. Um, and not just cultural communities, but occupational communities and gender communities. And, um, and I feel so strongly about the work of making people understand that the formation of social identity is about how you connect with a variety of communities. Um, and that's interestingly complex work to do when you're the city folklorist for four million people. Um, I'm sure Steve knows that uh, well. And at the same time, and this is, this is part of the complexity of it, is this whole notion of collaborating with communities, not simply sort of selecting uh, a particular cultural tradition or cultural community out of a hat, um, but actually finding ways to work with that community. Uh, uh, a recent project that I worked uh, on for many years in, uh, in collaboration with my colleague Carl Lindahl was a project called Surviving Katrina and Rita in Houston. And for me, it, it probably um, was the most significant public 
folk life project I've ever done because it was absolutely elementally collaborative. It was not simply about, and you know, I, I think, uh, or as passionate as all of us can be about our work, we as folklorists do have a capacity to name the other the informant and descend on communities with our agendas. Um, and the great thing about the Surviving Katrina and Rita in Houston project was the notion of, of handing the tools over to the community itself, giving them the skill set, training them in many of the ways we've been trained to, to be the documenter of their own community. And I think, um, you know, why aren't there more of us, number one, but why aren't we teaching everyone to be us? Why aren't we teaching all the communities that we work with? And I think increasingly, many of us are trying to do that, and that's become an issue that informs uh, my work uh, and a principle that is increasingly um, informing my work because uh, we do the best job of educating in public folklore when we let the people we are working with represent themselves. I know it's all been said now. No, but at the heart of what I do is creating relationships. I think you first mentioned relationships. Uh, I have my whole career, my whole life has been committed to uh, cultural representation. I have been caught in what Richard Curing would uh, call culture broker, which can be interpreted in many different ways. And I have had to have created relationships at different levels, and it's different ways of creating relationships. I have to uh, work with uh, ministers of culture in Colombia, who well knows, and create a relationship there so that we can co-produce knowledge. We are co-producing at different levels. Every time uh, the forum that I have is for the Smithsonian Folk Life Festival, because I feel, I feel the responsibility of being in the Smithsonian to create this forum for people to speak in their own voice. And many, many, many of the people that we are inviting to a festival are usually underrepresented people. And here they have a national mall. You're here, I'm not even a young Mexican, turning over the national mall, telling people, this is yours, Miss Sunday. Here's where you have your voice. But it's these, these relationships from working with the Ministry of Culture, from negotiating with my uh, anthropology and folklorist colleagues, in the different countries to actually working uh, with communities and with individuals. And I and just to explain a little story with uh, an example of this is with the Mexico program, you know, I've always tried to do programs with Mexico and Mexico. So if I'm not living in Mexico, at least I'm opening the door for Mexico, you know, borderlands in Rio. And then we did do uh, Mexico Profundo program. And uh, yes, I had to um, establish some relationships with my colleagues at the Institute of Anthropology. And with some of my colleagues, uh, the psychologist Shilona Luna, who was part of this earlier, how do you establish relationships? Well, you use a lot of strategies. Workshops are good. You bring people together. You should tell them what, what you want, what you're looking for. Try to bring them in. Try to connect their agendas with your agenda. We all have agendas. Um, and it's talking about what we wanted to do with Mexico, bring, bring to them all this Mexico Profundo, the deep Mexico, the yellow of Pipataya we always talk about, you know, the Mexico that has been ignored and yet has been lifted up here as our folklore, as long as there's no people involved in it. Uh, so I was talking to a colleague earlier on, going to uh, this uh, conference in Mexico where the crafts are really just automatically anything that is traditional craft is Indian. So Shilone, who is an ethnomusicologist who has worked with a friend of uh, Dan Shee, he actually he got her into this meeting, um, worked with uh, Vijarika, uh, we used to call them the Vijoles. She listened very carefully as to, you know, why do we do the festival? We have the festival not only to entertain. For me, it is very important that the people I'm inviting to the festival are going to gain something from it. And we, so uh, she and said, you know, Olivia, we really should involve Vijarika. These are communities in 
northwestern Mexico. There are over three different uh, states, very organized. Uh, they are, they, right now they have a council for the preservation of their sacred lands. It's interesting, they have uh, the, their sacred sites, like seven seven sacred sites. Several of these sacred sites are outside their own territory in a different state. And she said, you know, this would be a really good opportunity for you, for them, to let the world know what their plight is. These are lands that are being invaded by, uh, by mining companies. The lands are fighting uh, for the rights with, with the government. So um, initially, she established in relationship with Shidone so that she could, and, and here is a scholar from another country, although I'm Mexican, I'm kind of trained here. Already a bridge you have to go across there. And she managed to get us invited to uh, one of the meetings of, of the Council of, the Council for the Protection of Sacred Sites in Guadalajara, and she he was with me. And of course, there were the transferring, transferring authorities at the time. They listened to us very nicely. Yes, yes, we'll listen to you. Then they invited us to a community meeting. Once the transfer of authorities had been made, and there was a, I um, drove up with Shilon and up into the mountains of, um, near Durango, on the border of Durango and Jalisco. And um, you get there, and of course, they've just uh, sacrificed the calf for the meetings. Uh, we sat down for uh, maybe about six hours, until, until lunchtime, until lunch they get there at around two o'clock, listening to the communities present their petitions, the communities give their reports of what's happening, most of the time in Vijarica. Uh, then we had lunch, had some of that great calf. And then Shilonan and I made our presentation, a PowerPoint presentation. And of course, Shilonan has worked with them for many, many, many years, they know her very well, the authorities respect her very much. And at the very end, she tried to push me and said, well, you know, what do you think? Do you think you are interested in participating? <coughs> Push back, we'll let you know. Um, I did not go to the next ensuing meetings, but kept always informed by email. They have a secretary, and the secretary would email me. They agreed after a great debate that they did not want to be folklorized. That's why you know, I'm very leery about using folklore at all, especially in Latin America. That we folklorized. Although at the same time, they're very savvy. In Vijanica, you always find them, you know, they're, they're doing a lot of mariachi stuff because they're putting their traditional country. Because they bring in money on the other side. But this was a very important um, decision they had to make. And they agreed not as a community to come, they agreed as a council. They agreed to, uh, together, and this is where uh, creating relationships were very critical to me. And I know how the festival works, but I have to agree to let them select who they want to bring and what they can present, what they want to present. So, very democratic. They had 15 slots, we got 18 somehow. They had 15 slots and they brought five people from three different communities. Um, I think I worked with some of them. Some of them did not know each other. And I don't know, and to me, when I have really been successful in cultural representation, is when a community can take over the national mall, can take over the festival, take over the festival and still engage the audience. Uh, I've never seen a community take over the mall. Yes, they had their ceremonies, and they also had ceremonies where next to them they had their maps of their territories that were endangered. And uh, before I knew it, uh, there's somebody on the, a little walkie-talkie saying, Olivia, I think there's an exchange of money on the National Mall. I said, ooh, we have. We had three shamans there. We had a shaman from each community. And what do shamans do? They're healers, and uh, they realized that they had an incredible audience there. So they were doing individual healing on the National Mall. And of course, you know, they weren't going to miss a chance there. They put the hat out. So I had to quickly tell Steve, to the, uh, Steve Kidd, yes, yes, it's very traditional when you do a healing, you have to put some money on it. So the National Park Service would not say anything. But uh, to me, this is sort of 
at the heart of what I'm learning to do is creating these relationships, these relationships of trust and of risk. Getting to the, and also the relationship with, within the Smithsonian, allowing me to risk the National Museum letting these outsiders coming in, taking it over, and defining what the festival is. So I, the more, I mean, this is to me the epitome of what I'd like to do as a legacy. We, uh, there was a fourth question I had asked the panelists to prepare, and we are running short on time. So I will ask you, just I guess for the record, we, we do want your answer to the fourth question. If you could limit your answer to about five minutes, um, that would get everybody's voice into this panel before we end, and they kick us out of three turns. So <laughs> the fourth question you all were asked to think about was, were there chance events and accidental encounters that forwarded your career? So let's change that to the singular. Was there a chance event <laughs> or a particular encounter in five minutes? And we'll go now, Olivia, Pat, Joe, and Steve. I love this question. There, there is this chance event. I took an internship, if you can believe, back in uh, with Virginia Cassiano, the National Center for Urban Ethnic Affairs. That was Gina Baroni's outfit, you know, way back there. And somehow she conned me and writing a proposal. This is a NEA expansion arts is just coming in because the National Endowment for the Arts is taken. We've been battling to get money to community arts or new program. And, and I got some little money there to do a festival conference. And this was sort of, the festivals were a cure for every uh, evil that was happening to our cities, to all the riots. Okay, so we brought together, and this is talking about relationships, talking about people believing in me. I, I had $25,000 and paid my salary and had three conferences, and the idea was to bring performing art, performance artists, folklorists, uh, city planners, these different voices to talk about festival. And uh, our keynote speaker was David Wisnett, and I think this is the first time I've heard that term, key to the politics of culture. And this was a conference called The Politics of Culture. And um, I was very young then. Uh, Smithsonian, uh, the Smithsonian was very nice. They collaborated, they lent me their folklore, the same thing with the Library of Congress. And Susan Kutchick says, you know, festival, why don't you go call Victor Turner? I didn't know who Victor Turner was. And I get on the phone and I call Victor. And Victor Turner, I have, I have, I mean, people that have transformed me. I think he gave me a story of folk festival and of his life over the phone for about three hours. The next person, um, Susan says, oh, you should talk to Roger Abrams. Roger was doing all this great stuff. He was in the Caribbean. And uh, get on the phone. Well, Roger wasn't there, but guess who was? Dick, Dick Bauman. Again, these incredibly generous people talking to this ignorant person that knew nothing of anything, but totally transformed me and totally set me out to search for what am I talking about? And that's, that's it. Thank you. Uh, Olivia, Pat, Joe, Steve. Well, I think we're going to have to Okay, I'm going to be very short and sweet. I had a number of things I was going to talk about. So wise of you, Pravina. Um, and, and I actually didn't think about this until um, I was literally sitting up here uh, with my colleagues. And the single most serendipitous thing that occurred to me over the course of my career is that I became a public folklorist. Like many of us in my generation, I went to graduate school expecting fully to get my PhD and become a professor of folklore and find a job at a small college probably in the middle of nowhere. Um, and, you know, just kind of go off into the uh, horizon. And at that moment in time, when I was in graduate school, public folklore was really inventing itself. In fact, I think we may have the person who is considered to be the first public folklorist in the United States here in our audience. Am I, am I right, Henry? Well, you know what, I guess what I'm referring to is state folklorists. Yeah. State folklorists. And, uh, but literally that field was, 
was inventing itself, and Bess had moved, the, the folk arts program had been developed at the National Endowment for the Arts, and there was a very big push to place public folklorists in state arts agencies or other similar state institutions. But even before I landed at the Texas Commission on the Arts, I was hired to do some public programming. I was hired to develop four uh, video documentaries at Austin Community Television. Um, I was hired to do field work on Texas music and presented at a major uh, museum in Fort Worth. Um, I was, uh, I, I developed along with some of the colleagues that I mentioned earlier an exhibition uh, entitled La Vela Prendida, uh, Mexican American Women's Home Altars. Um, probably one of the very first explorations of the home altar tradition um, ever mounted. Um, and in the course of doing that work, I was completely transformed. I realized, and forgive me for putting it this way, but I, it's really very much the way I feel about it. I realized that rather than spend my life trying to convince middle class white kids that this material was important, I could instead choose to spend every day of my career working alongside these communities in whatever manner was relevant to, to forward their issues, their traditions, their values, their histories. And I was transformed. Joe and Steve. A uh, coincidental meeting with was uh, most crucial in my development. Happened uh, early on my senior year at Oakland College, the fall of 1956. I was majoring in physics and doing a lot of folk music extracurricularly. I went to a gathering with some friends in Chesterton, Ohio, and there was a woman there named Anne Grimes. She was very active in the Ohio Folklore Society. She was a collector and recording artist, and I was quite amazed at all this, and I went up to her expecting to be totally laughed at and asked her if she knew about any place you could do graduate work in folk music. She said, you know, she thought there was, but I, I should write for advice, leads to Mrs. Ray Corson, head of the Archive of Folk Song, Library of Congress, which I did. And that she directed me to Indiana University, and that's where I ended up. And Ray Corson used to visit her uh, while I was at IU, research business and whatnot. And I was there for an AFS meeting, a session at the Library of Congress in December of 1962. She called me into her office and said, we have an opening for a reference librarian. How would you like to apply? Here are the forms. <laughs> So, so I'll tell you this this, uh, this coincidence actually was told to me by my daughter just just yesterday when she said, "Dad, you know, Dad, you know, you always told us that the only reason I'm alive is that when you were a kid, your parents, which is true, my parents, was I lived in Brazil, in South America, they went on a trip to the States and they brought me back some records, and one of them was a '78 yellow record, you know, big big yellow record, only had one song on it, and it was the Red River Valley." And I said, I said, I listened to that song, and that song, if, that, if I had not fallen in love with that song and thought it was the most beautiful song I'd ever heard, I would not have gone into folklore, I would not have met your mother, <laughs> and I, which, which, uh, which, uh, which, which brings up another remarkable coincidence, which is that Amanda's dad, uh, I should, she should be telling her this story, but Amanda's dad was, of course, the ultimate cheapskate, he's still around at the age of 94. And he he always bought second he bought secondhand bread things that were really like you know any, anything fifteen day old bread perfect you know so so uh, he and he went through the used book bins and bought twenty five cent books that had had the covers torn torn off and he brought one home with the cover torn off and it was Alan Lomax's Folk Song USA and in the back of the book there was an address to write to for more information and it was Joe. And she sent, she sent Joe a letter sent, asking for information, and he sent her all of the information about all the program. <laughs> and, and, he, and later on, she went, and, and, and many years later, went and told him about it, and said, you know, I wrote you that letter. He went into the argument and says, you know, I know, I have that letter. <laughs> In the archives. And so that, children, is the story of how it all came to be. <laughs> Formally, 
quickly uh, thank everybody and then we can open it up if anybody has any uh, burning questions or last minute things they want to say. So I'm just going to uh, conclude the session by thanking once again Pat Jasper, Olivia Cadaval, Steve Zeidman, Joe Hickerson, Matt Hale who is uh, recording this, Tim Lloyd and Lorraine Cashman for allowing us to uh, once again do this. I want to thank the panelists for sharing their lives with us for giving us an idea of the intellectual history and the synergy in Philadelphia, in New York City, in Bloomington, in Washington, D.C., in Texas, both Austin and Houston. And I particularly want to thank them all for teaching us about folklore and for their wonderful contributions to our field of folklore. So thank, thank our panel. Thank you. It was really fun for all of us. Let's speak for everyone. So I don't know, we have 15 minutes. Do you guys want to come in individually? Lee Herring has a question. Steve, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about Ross Agard telling you, telling Saul Agard's the story of his day. And I'm sure this has been worked out by philosophers. But people go around the world trying to look in the mirror. That's what really people want to do. They want to see themselves. And uh, that's uh, that's why folklore is interesting. Because, uh, you hit one level of it, it's the aesthetics of everyday life. It's, it's, your, it's a reflection of yourself. My house is a projection of my insides. And um, the, but we now know that the human mind is in capable of representing its insides without artistry. That is, there's some kind of process in that that goes on. Therefore. When I give a representation of myself, it isn't myself, it's a representation of myself. And so, it's Ross make, telling the story, and then Saul seeing himself in the story. From there, it seems to me, all of our uh, dedication to artistic creation as a reflection of ourselves, it seems to me it all starts right there. The, 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 the difficult problems of the self and the other are not all really that difficult. <laughs> if, you, if you, what do you think? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> I mean, it's you know. I mean, I I do think that there's a lot in that. I mean, I I I see that you know that we. Our creations are, you know, a reflection of ourselves, and we we see ourselves in, in the people that we meet, and we learn about ourselves and the people that we meet, even when we're trying to depict them as accurately as we can. <laughs> Any other questions? 